Hey everybody, hope you're having a good day. We're going to dig into the last step of protein synthesis here uh, called translation. So we've made uh, the mRNA through transcription, right? We've gone from DNA to RNA. And so now we have to somehow switch from the language of nucleic acids to the language of proteins. So we have to go from uh, nucleic acids to amino acids. So let's let's start digging in here. I really like the sound effects. We're gonna get rid of that. So we looked at um, we looked at this diagram yesterday, where you have the DNA in the vault, and then you make the copies of the mRNA. And now they're gonna go out and find that protein factory. Uh, which is the ribosome. So that's what we're going to focus today. Notice transcription is taking place in the nucleus because it involves DNA. Translation is going to take place um, out in the cytoplasm at the ribosome, right? So let's start figuring this out. So the ribosome itself looks like this, kind of down here in this picture. And it's pretty unique. Um, only non-membrane bound organelle. So we usually consider it an organelle even though it doesn't have a membrane. Uh, or is it an enzyme? Because it's actually made of rRNA and proteins. So is it uh, just an enzyme that's doing things? Um, we do typically call it an organelle, um, but it's actually very active, right? So it's going to be uh, making proteins for us. Um, and all of the ribosomes have two subunits, which we'll get to in a minute and they have what's called three sites, okay? So here are your sites. You generally have an A site, a P site, and an E site, which spell ape, um, although they're actually used in, in reverse order. Uh, so um, I take that back. They're used in the order of ape, but from right to left, opposite reading order. So you'll see what I mean in a minute. So A site, stands for aminoacyl. This is where the amino acids enter the ribosome. The P site is the peptidyl site because this is where you're making your polypeptide. And remember, polypeptide is another word for protein. And then E is just the exit site um, where the empty tRNAs are going to leave the ribosome, okay? And the reason I was talking about them being backwards is because here is where things enter so it's the A site, and then the P site, and then the E site. So the APE is being spelled that way. Or you can think of EPA, which is Environmental Protection Agency. Either way. Um, so as far as um, what these things do, like we mentioned earlier, the A site is going to be where things enter. The P site is going to be where that polypeptide grows. And if you look at this one over here, you can see that the, the chain of amino acids is growing out the top of the ribosome. And this is going to be where the, the peptide uh, ends up forming up here. <clears throat> and so uh, what's going to happen is you have your tRNA, which is shown right here as this like turquoise um, little tube. And you have the purple thing attached to it, which is the amino acid uh, that got brought to the ribosome by the tRNA. We will get to all of this. Uh, just trying to orient you a little bit. Notice we have a small ribosomal subunit down here, and we have a large ribosomal subunit up here. So there are two sections of the ribosome that come together just before uh, making the protein. tRNA is a major player. So uh, tRNAs tend to get drawn in different ways uh, in textbooks and things. So uh, I put a few different ones up here for you. Uh, you know, you have the two-dimensional structure where it's all laid out and it kind of looks like a T. Uh, the three-dimensional structure is where it's kind of folded up. And then a lot of, you know, the cartoony design of it is the one over here on the right. And it really shows how you can um, find the anticodon, which we'll get to in a little bit, uh, really easily. These three letters right here, as well as down here. Uh, those three letters are going to match up with the codon. The anticodon will match up with the codon of the mRNA. So how does the amino acid get attached to the tRNA? Well, you need an enzyme for that. So this is the enzyme, aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. It's a long one. Okay, It's the seahorse. That's what I call the seahorse, this little gray seahorse-looking guy right here. 
That is your amino acyl tRNA synthetase enzyme. You have your amino acid here. You have your um, ATP here because it's going to cost a little ATP to make this happen. And so you have your empty, what we call the empty or uncharged TNA, uh, tRNA right here because uh, it does not have an amino acid yet. But notice there's kind of a groove right here for the tRNA, and there's another groove up here for uh, the amino acid. So the amino acid is uh, being put into um, the enzyme, the synthetase enzyme, uh, and then we get the tRNA in there as well. And basically it kind of works like a crimper. So it um, will move a little bit and flex a little bit, and it will add this amino acid to the tRNA here. And when it comes out, it has it attached now. It has the amino acid attached to the tRNA, and this is what we call charged. Once that amino acid is on that tRNA, we say that that tRNA is now charged. Okay, so that is how it gets on there. That uh, enzyme is really long, um, but I would pay attention to it and make sure you know um, how what it does and maybe even how to spell it. Uh, close enough so I can tell. So how do mRNA and tRNA communicate? Um, well, they have to use the genetic code, right? We have to switch languages from the language of amino acids to, sorry, from the language of nucleic acids to the language of amino acids. And so we're going to work up to uh, how this gets done here. So for and you guys probably remember this part from regular bio. Most people tend to remember um, the groups and how they're made. So we have four DNA bases, right? So we have four DNA bases. We have four RNA bases. We made a little change, right, from T to U. Um, and so this sequence is just getting converted, right? And we're doing a little complementary base pairing, right? So right here, you can follow that all the way down, little complementary base pairing. But if there's an A here, we can't put a T down here, so we have to put a U, okay? And then we start looking at the proteins, and there's actually 20 proteins, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, there's 20 amino acids. That's actually kind of a misnomer right there on my slide. Sorry about that. Um, there's way more proteins. There's 20 amino acids. How can you code for 20 amino acids with only four nucleotide bases? That was the question that they were trying to answer uh, many years ago. And so if you look, they started figuring out that mRNA codes for proteins in triplets or in groups of three. And these groups of three ended up being called codons, okay? And that each codon coded for an amino acid and then the string of amino acids would then make the protein. And you guys should remember that from the beginning of the year when we did biochemistry. You guys know that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, I'm sure. So if we look here at how the code got cracked, Crick again was involved. Okay, so Francis Crick is involved once again um, and determined the three-letter triplet or codon system. Okay, so if you look at this crazy little, you know, this is just a string of letters here, right? Which ends up being a silly sentence. Uh, why did the red bat eat the fat rat? And so all three letter words um, or codons. And so uh, each one kind of codes for, would code for an amino acid in genetics. For us, each one, those string of letters become words, right? And then we put the words together and we make sentences. And so um, this is really kind of how uh, the genetic code works as well as they build up from letters to groups of letters to then uh, sentences uh, or proteins. Nuremberg and Karan, a couple other scientists, determined uh, started determining which amino acids were matching uh, which mRNA codons. And what they did is they made some artificial uh, uracil, they made some artificial U's, and they strung a bunch of them together. Uh, and they figured out that UUU, the codon for UUU, would give you phenylalanine. It would give you phenylalanine every time. And so now they started figuring out, okay, this is, what, this is what's going on, that these strings of letters are going to code for amino acids. So enter the genetic code, right? And you guys should have 
Um, you guys should have looked at um, a chart like this before in regular bio. Um, and let's just kind of go through a little bit of it here. Here's the first base. On the left-hand side is the first base. We have the second base up here, and we have the third base over here. So how you read this thing. Let's just say um, your letters were ACG, okay? ACG, well, how do you read this? Well, your first letter is an A. Your second base is a C. So if you track this down and see where these two intersect, you get to this group of letters. And then you look over here at your third base and you find the G and you come straight across and you find ACG right here. Um, generally, you don't have to look at the third column too much. You kind of look at the A and you look at the C and you get to your group of letters and you just quickly scan and find the one you're looking for. Okay, so ACG. And ACG codes for THR, which is 309. Okay, so we know that ACG codes for 309. But look, ACC also codes for 309, and ACU also codes for 309, and ACA also codes for 309. So what we say is that the code is redundant, but it's not ambiguous. If you're not sure what those words are, redundant means repeats, right? The code is redundant, meaning I can have any one of these four codons, and I will always get 309. So that's a little redundant, okay? But it's not ambiguous. And that word ambiguous means um, where you don't really know what you have. There is no guessing with the code. Right? You don't have you could pick any three letters and there's no guessing. You will know exactly what you get. So it's redundant, but it's not ambiguous. Several codons for each amino acid. And the third base is what we call the wobble. Okay? The third base is called the wobble base because look, as long as I get AC, 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 as long as I get AC, I'm gonna get 309. Does it really matter what the third base is? It doesn't. It's interchangeable. Okay. That's why we call it the wobble because it's kind of interchangeable. It doesn't really matter uh, whether it's the U, the C, the A, or the G. I'm still going to get three and I. Okay. So that third position, uh, that third base, that third position is called the wobble because you pretty much, um, a lot of times, it doesn't matter what you're going to get. And if you look around the chart, you'll see uh, how much redundancy is. I did one where there's four, right? Three and nine has four. I don't think there's any other 309s uh, in here. Phenylalanine only has two, okay? There's only two codons that will code for phenylalanine, UUU and UUC. Now, when you get to UUA and UUG, you get something slightly different, which is called leucine, and you also get leucine with these four right here. So leucine has six uh, different codons. So it's usually, it's usually two, four, or six, um, for the uh, redundancy for the amino acids in here. And there are also uh, a few weird ones in here. And if you look really carefully, uh, some of them don't even code for amino acids at all. Here's one of the ones that is different, and it is called AUG. And it's the only way that you can get methionine. And it's called the start codon. I have to stop using my ink to click. So AUG is methionine, and it's the start codon, and it will be there in front of all of your uh, things that would get translated. It's always there. It's what uh, gets looked for as the trigger. This sequence is the trigger for where to start translating um, the mRNA uh, at the ribosome. It's always going to look for that AUG, and that's what we call it, the start codon. There are also three stop codons. If you look right up here, there are three stop codons. Actually, I should do this, okay? Because this one's not a stop. UGA, UAA, and UAG. These are not amino acids. They don't have amino acids. So these are three sequences where you don't get any amino acids at all. And those um, will tell, uh, they will tell the ribosome when to stop and let go of that protein um, and make it. So. Let's keep going forward here, and we'll actually look at, by the way, this little question here. I know I hinted on it, but I didn't really get through the whole thing. Why is the wobble good? Well, what would the wobble help you get away with, 
right? If we go back to my three and nine example, ACU, ACC, ACA, or ACG, okay? What if there was a mutation in that third spot and it put the different letter there? If it's supposed to be ACU, but I got ACA, does that matter? Nope. So it actually helps get away with some mutations um, where uh, it just wouldn't have an effect on the protein. You might have a, I have something in my eye, you might have a mutation there but you wouldn't um, notice it because of that wobble base, okay? So you get the wobble and you get the interchangeable part, the mutation may not matter very much. All right, so if we get into translation and how the nuts and bolts are actually gonna work, we have the three steps that we've been working with on replication and transcription. You have initiation, elongation, and termination. Um, you have an mRNA attaches to the ribosome for initiation. Again, your chain is going to grow. In this case, it's going to be the polypeptide chain that's going to grow. And then you have the polypeptide being released uh, in the termination stage. So for, for initiation, uh, you have the mRNA is going to attach to the small ribosomal subunit first. And then uh, the larger ribosomal subunit will come attached to that small one. It's going to look for methionine, right? That is the start codon. So it's going to look for methionine, um, and that's where it's going to um, start reading uh, the codons. So that AUG codon is lined up in the P site um, of the ribosome. And that's going to be important because remember I told you that we have the A site, the P site, and the E site that works like this. The very first codon is actually going to start here. All other codons will start here. In the A site, okay? So I'll show you that when we get to the diagram here in a second. So here is, here is where we're going with this. We have the mRNA and it's attached to the small ribosomal subunit first. And here is methionine. And so we have AUG, the codon AUG is going to get matched with UAC, right? So we have the codon and the anticodon. We have the codon on the mRNA. And then we have the anticodon on the tRNA, and they are complementary, like most things are when they match up. You have the A and the U, the U and the A, and the G and the C. Okay, so they always match up like this. The three codons have to match with the three anticodons, like that. And so, um, as we move on, the large ribosomal subunit is going to come attach, and notice that the first tRNA right here is in the P site. Okay. It is in the P site and the A site remains empty. That's the only one that does that, okay? It's only the start codon that starts in the P. Everything else will come into that A site behind it. So how this goes, if we work around this diagram here. Um, actually, let me get rid of this and put up the description so you guys can see them. So if we start up here with number one, the next codon determines um, the next amino acid to be brought to the ribosome. The incoming charge TNA enters at the A site, right? Um, so this is where the AUG codon would have started or the tRNA would have started, right? And the next ones all come into the A site. And you can see the codon is, or the anticodon is right here on the tRNA, and it's going to match up with the codon, these three letters, that are in the A site. So they're going to match. It's going to bring the proper amino acid based on those uh, codons and anticodons matching. So here it is now in the A site. Okay, in step two, it's in the A site and you have to transfer the amino acid over. So what happens? It's really tiny, but you see this arrow right in here in between them. The chain, this long chain right here, is going to go be put on top of this amino acid, okay? So this chain will come off and get put right here on top of that amino acid. And so you can see that right here in this picture. There's just a brief millisecond, there is no nothing attached right here in the P site. <clears throat> and the chain got moved over on top of this amino acid. So now this tRNA will shift into the next site, this one will shift. It's now here. And the one that was empty, the one that is now empty that had the chain will get ejected out of the E site. 
okay? So it will leave out of that E site called the exit site. And now it is uncharged. We have an uncharged tRNA and it will be able to uh, be available to have another amino acid put on it uh, by that enzyme again. What's that enzyme called? That is the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, okay? The ones that put the, the amino acids on the tRNAs. This word down here translocates. This says the ribosome shifts, it translocates. So rather than the ribosome kind of holding steady and the um, mRNA like sliding through, it's more the other way around. It's more the ribosome that's going down and reading the code like this. So the ribosome is moving um, more so than the mRNA. And I'm gonna put, post a couple video clips for you guys because it's much easier to see this stuff in motion. So I'll post some video clips for you to check out. Um, so be sure you do that. So if we move on to termination, so eventually it's going to reach a stop codon. It's going to reach one of those three stop codons we just looked at in the chart. And so when it gets there, the polypeptide is going to be released and the ribosome is going to disassemble. So point out a couple things here. So we get to a stop codon, right? We get to either UAG, UAA, or UGA. Uh, you have this release factor, which is kind of like a placeholder, and it's gonna come in and say basically, hey, we're done here. And then it is going to release the protein, the polypeptide, and it will go out and it will do its folding and it will um, be ready to be shipped to wherever it needs to go. And then the ribosomal, the large unit um, and the small unit will now disassociate or come apart. Okay, and actually that mRNA will still be available if it's still being protected, if GTP, GTP cap is still there and the poly A tail, uh, tail is still there, uh, it's viable for another ribosome to come attach to it and be red again and make the same protein. Sometimes you need a lot of protein in a short amount of time. So mRNAs will keep um, making uh, or keep being available to be red to make protein uh, if necessary. Protein targeting. So where are these things going to go now? So um, oftentimes there's a signal peptide, which uh, I refer to as like an address label. It's kind of like the barcode on your uh, Amazon box that shows up on your porch. It's where it tells it to go. Um, so you'll see a, uh, a signal peptide down here that is getting attached to the uh, protein. And then you have also this um, signal recognition particle that's going to attach to that. And it's going to kind of give it, um, again, the address and the shipping destination for where it needs to go. Uh, we won't touch too much more on the, the SRP or that signal uh, peptide. I just kind of wanted you to know that they were there. So as these get made and as your protein gets made in this particular diagram, this is on the rough ER, right? Ribosomes exist on the rough ER. And so it's making uh, what looks like this string of pearls right here. Uh, that's your protein. And so it happens to end up. Um, in the ER, right? And so um, possible destinations are all, you know, listed up here, depending on if they're going to stay in the cell or get shipped out of the cell. Um, but you have the Golgi, the nucleus, the mitochondria, chloroplast, cell membrane, cytoplasm, all sorts of things uh, where it could go. So here's a quick little review for you. So let's see if you can tell the story, although since we're not really interacting together, I'll have to tell the story for you. But where would we start first? If we need to talk about all of protein synthesis together here, transcription and translation, it's always going to kick off with the DNA, right? And transcription always happens inside the nucleus because DNA can never, ever, ever, ever leave the nucleus, right? So anything that involves DNA is going to stay inside that nucleus. So RNA polymerase, remember, it's going to recognize where to start based on the transcription factors and the transcription factors recognize where to start because of the TATA box, that sequence of TATA -A, um, in that promoter uh, in front of the gene. Okay, so RNA polymerase here is going to recognize it, it's going to read it, and it's going to make our uh, pre mRNA. Remember, the pre mRNA is much longer than your mature mRNA, and that's because we have the parts we want, which are the exons, and the parts we don't want, which are the introns. Okay, and we're going to splice those out. Splicing is not shown here, uh, but we went through that yesterday. So we have our SNRPs and our spliceosomes that are going to go in there and cut out the introns. Okay, put the exons together, 
And then we're going to modify that mRNA a little bit further before it heads out into the cytoplasm so it has protection. We have the 5' prime GTP cap, and we have the poly A10. Okay, that is our mature mRNA. It's much shorter because we cut out the introns. Now we have our large and small ribosomal subunit. They are going to find uh, an, um, an mRNA and come together and start reading it. We have the sites in order from right to left, the APE sites. It is getting red, just like all the direction that we've ever built in. It will be red in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, so we build DNA five to three, we build RNA five to three, and we're going to read the mRNA five to three. Um, so it finds the start codon, the AUG, starts reading. Uh, here come the tRNAs. Okay, the tRNA is going to get charged. Uh, by adding the amino acid to it, it becomes charged, and that enzyme again is the aminoacyl tRNA synthetase that is putting the amino acid on the tRNA. tRNA is bringing the amino acid to the ribosome. The codon and anticodon have to match up from the RNA to the tRNA, and then the polypeptide chain will be growing. The amino acid chains will be growing out of the P site. Um, and then the E site will eject the empty tRNAs or the uncharged ones, okay? So this is kind of a little animated diagram here for you. So we'll see if we can do uh, a little bit more and see if we can explain some more things that you guys have seen before, but maybe in a different way here. So here's the transcriptional unit or a gene, mainly the gene and sometimes a little bit around the gene. So here's the DNA. And in front of the DNA is the promoter. There's the Tata box, right? And it's usually about 20 to 30 bases upstream from the gene. There can also be an enhancer, which we'll talk about in another set of notes. The RNA polymerase finds the Tata box, and that happens because there's usually transcription factors that are not shown here. Polymerase is then um, going to read this entire uh, piece of DNA. And there's the transcription start and the transcription stop. Okay, but we're just um, going through this right now. So the polymerase is now reading. Here are your introns and your exons. Okay, so now I want to point something out. Here's where transcription started, right? Transcription started here. Notice the translation start is down here. So there's a few bases in this area right here. Uh, that will not be translated. They were transcribed, but they will not be translated because they are in front of the TAC. And maybe you're saying, well, what's the TAC? Why is that so important? Well, flip that. Flip those letters. What's the T become? That's the A. What's the A become? That's the U. And what's the C become? That's the G. This is our, this is going to be our start codon, right? Once we get this red, this is going to be our start codon because this has the T in it. That's still the DNA, right? So when we flip it to mRNA, this is going to be our AUG. This is going to be where we start. So when I pop up these little regions here that are labeled as UTRs, UTR untranslated region. There's one at the front and there's one at the back. There's one in front of the TAC, and there's one in back of the stop codon, which would be this area right here, this blue area right here, um, after the stop codon, where, again, this area was transcribed, but it will not be translated. Okay, So UTRs just stand for untranslated region. So now we move on. We have our, uh, our pre-mRNA, right? We have our mRNA transcript that we copied. Five to three. We have to get rid of the introns through splicing, and there's our mature mRNA um, transcript that will move into the cytoplasm. And now they also have the GTP cap and the poly A tails on them. Okay. So, yeah, a little side note here on prokaryotes no splicing, right? Protein synthesis, no splicing. It's not in a nucleus. Um, and so you have. Um, a little bit quicker process going on um, with your prokaryotes than you do the eukaryotes. So right here, if we move into a table, hang on one second here, guys. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, so prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. So um, 
obviously the DNA in the prokaryote is going to be in the cytoplasm um, because they don't have a nucleus. And for the eukaryote, it'll be in the nucleus. For prokaryotes, one circular chromosome. For DNA, many linear chromosomes. Prokaryotes have what we call uh, naked DNA. They do not do any uh, winding with the histone proteins like we talked about in eukaryotes. For prokaryotes, no introns. Eukaryotes definitely have introns and exons, which means eukaryotes do splicing and prokaryotes do not. Okay, no splicing for prokaryotes. And <clears throat> we'll show you a little bit more on that in just a second. So there's your typical little splicing diagram that you guys have seen. So the way this goes down in a prokaryote is transcription and translation are simultaneous. They happen at the same time. Okay. So the DNA is in the cytoplasm. There's no mRNA editing whatsoever uh, because there's no introns. And so ribosomes read the mRNA as it's being transcribed. So what's going on here? And I'm going to uh, focus on the cartoon down here at first. So this is your DNA strand, okay? The horizontal strand there is your DNA strand. It's labeled right here. The one's dangling down, and it's kind of hard to see, but if we look at this right here, the mRNA label and the line that's coming, if you look right in here, you'll see a thin line, and it's the mRNA that dangles. And actually, all of these have a thin blue line, and there's an mRNA dangling down off of the DNA. So all of these mRNAs are being transcribed, and they're coming uh, right off of the DNA. Then what happens is, here's your, that was done by the um, RNA polymerase, the pink dots are your RNA polymerase, and that's what's making the mRNA. And then the ribosomes are all these purple dots that are just kind of glomming onto the mRNA. And so they're transcribing, the ribosomes are transcribing that mRNA as they're being trans, uh, transcribed. They're translating it, I should say, as they're being transcribed. And so it's making the protein literally as the mRNA is coming off. So these things are happening simultaneously. So if we look again at some more differences here um, between the prokes and the eukes, you have uh, time and physical separation between these processes, right? So for a eukaryote, it takes about an hour uh, to get from DNA to protein uh, by the time you have uh, transcription happening, and then you have splicing happening, and then you have translating happening. It's some, are, some take less than an hour, some take more than an hour, but on average about an hour to make a protein. Um, and then um, for the prokaryote, there's no RNA processing whatsoever, so it's almost instantaneous that you get the protein. It's far quicker um, than the uh, eukaryote, and you also have the physical space aspect where everything is happening in the same location in a prokaryote, but for a eukaryote, we have the first part happening, we have transcription happening in the nucleus, and then we have translation happening out here in the cytoplasm at the ribosome. So we even have a change of venue um, for the eukaryote where we have to move things outside the nucleus, uh, which can also take a bit of time. So there's some differences between the prokes and eukes for you. All right, switching gears slightly here. Since we did translation, we want to look at what happens when things don't go right. We want to look at some mutations. And there's two major types um, with some subtypes. Uh, we have the point mutation and we have the frame shift mutation. So a point mutation, like you might suspect, is just a one base change. Uh, one base is replaced by another. Uh, and then you have the frame shift where DNA bases get inserted or deleted, and it causes a whole lot of problems upstream and downstream. Uh, as far as which one is worse, um, while there are bad point mutations as well, generally the frame shift um, is a far um, bigger problem. Uh, there is an example down here I'll point out um, where we have, remember, wild type means normal, right? So we have the wild type hemoglobin, and over here we have the sickle cell hemoglobin. So here's the typical um, codons over here. Here's our mRNA. And then our normal hemoglobin makes glutamine right here, where this one letter change right here, we had a one letter substitution from those center letters right there. And now instead of GAA, we got GUA. 
and those code for different amino acids. And now we have valine instead of glutamine, and that means someone is going to get sickle cell instead. So sickle cell anemia, for all of its problems, is really caused by one simple point mutation. Okay. So let's look at the point mutations first. So um, they can be silent. You can change a letter and have no issue whatsoever. There could be no effect. You might just get lucky. And that's because of the redundancy of the code, right? If you change the third letter in almost all of those um, codons, remember, because of the wobble, uh, you're not going to get a change. You're going to get the exact same amino acid. So down here, we were supposed to get glycine. We had an A instead of a G, but it still gave us glycine. It still gave us the exact same um, uh, amino acid. So no problems with silent mutations. If you get to one called a missense, a missense changes one base for another, and you could get away with it, or it could be a harmful change. It just depends. Um, in this case, we are getting a T instead of a C right here, and so that's changing this letter right here, which is changing the first base, and that will most always give you a difference. We should have had glycine, and now we're getting serine. And now, so we have one different amino acid, right? And there's no specific disease associated with that mutation. So now you have a change in amino acid. Maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not. If this protein is 2,000 amino acids long and you have one amino acid that's different, you probably get away with it. You probably won't have that big a deal. If it's a much smaller protein and only 20 amino acids and you changed one, and it might be in the spot that is in the active site, now you could have a big problem. You don't really know uh, until you look at all these specific ones, uh, whether the problem's gonna be a big one or a small one. For nonsense mutations, so we had missense, now we have nonsense. Which one sounds worse to you, missense or nonsense? To me, nonsense sounds worse, which it is. Because nonsense, that one letter base change we got is now coding for a stop codon. Okay, so now, we had an A instead of a T, the same problem with the last one, but in, because of where it happens, it changes this codon to UAG, okay? Instead of AAG, AAG gives you lysine, UAG gives you a stop codon. So now maybe this protein was supposed to be 400 amino acids long, and now it's only four amino acids long because of that change. That's a really big deal. That protein's never going to do its job, okay? So nonsense mutations code for stop codons and are generally worse than your typical point mutation. You're worse than your missense. Let's go ahead and move on to frame shift mutations. Here we have extensive missense. So where the reading frame and a ribosome was altered um, downstream because it's still a one-letter change, but rather than a substitution, it is an insertion or a deletion. And so in this case, we have an A missing, okay? And if the A is missing, now you're gonna translate that and that now the U is missing. So we should have methionine, lysine, phenylalanine, and uh, glycine. Instead, we got uh, methionine and lysine, and now we have leucine and alanine. We have two wrong right from both of those we have two wrong and you know this is going to keep happening so everywhere after that base was deleted the groups of three are all going to be incorrect right we should have these groups of three right here okay and right up here they should have but because they are changing and this u is missing now uh, those groups of three are going to be shifted all the way down, and we're going to have big problems. So frame shift are way worse. You have an immediate nonsense where, again, uh, you have an extra letter or a missing letter. Same idea where you have an insertion or a deletion, but again, you get the stop codon, right? You get uh, the stop codon right here. Instead of this whole protein being built, now it's being cut off. And you're going to have a whoops. You're going to have a much bigger issue. Uh, so you have what's called an immediate nonsense. Okay, and those come from insertions or deletions, where the other ones, the other nonsense ones, were from substitutions, a one-for-one -one change. Limited effect. You might get lucky, and you might have things getting changed in threes. 
So if you have things getting changed in threes, where basically either a whole codon is missing, um, it might be okay or it might not. Again, maybe you're missing one amino acid or maybe it caused a frame shift where everything is uh, now incorrect all the way downstream. And, you know, they're generally going to cause you a problem unless you just happen to get super lucky and the, the three that went in and the three that went out uh, either gave you the same amino acid or uh, didn't shift anything. It just replaced one codon for the other. Then you might get lucky. But most of the time, these cause frame shifts and uh, can cause big deals. Okay. All righty. We made it. That was a long one. Um, trying to get my face out of the way, but I can't. Um, you should be able to explain all of these steps, uh, compare all of the proc and uke, replication, transcription, translation, uh, go through all the genetic code, explain the relationship between DNA sequence and protein sequence. Uh, and describe all of these mutations. So lots going on. Uh, and just a quick heads up, you will have two quizzes next week. You had nothing due this week at all. We had uh, some sets of notes, and we're going to have some practice questions uh, later in the week. Next week, you're going to have a vocab quiz Friday, and you're going to have a central dogma quiz um, ne next Friday. Did I say that incorrectly? You're going to have a vocab quiz Monday, central dogma quiz Friday. Okay, two quizzes next week. So really start digging into all this information, okay? All right, I will stop uh, jabbering at you. Have a good day, and I hope this uh, helped you guys. See you.